Glory Cloud Podcast, episode 167. Well, stay tuned for part two of Misusing Bible Texts. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Glory Cloud Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cahey, and I'm joined by our co-host, Pastor Todd Bordeaux of Cornerstone Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Houston, Texas. How are you, Todd? I'm well. I'm uh, excited for tonight because it's part two of, we did top ten last week of the most misused verses by the church, and now we are calling this one Nine More. (laughs) It seems like... uh... The response we got was was overwhelmingly positive. So, yeah, no one's too upset that their pet verse was not understood the way they always did. They seem to be open to, or they already knew. And our friend Jono from New Zealand apparently was invited to be a part of the power team. That was totally impromptu. We didn't even have the power team in our notes. <laughs> I know, but that was a great picture you put on the. <laughs> it fit with uh, Philippians four thirteen. So. I think I, I probably saw them twice in my life, and it just, what a, what a memory. <laughs> Those guys are so odd. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, before we dive right into nine more, I will just remind our listeners that we do have our show notes page over at meredithkline.com slash podcast. There you can find all of the resources that we mentioned during the course of an episode. Uh, we would sure appreciate it if you would give us a five-star rating. Nothing less than five stars will do. Um, on Apple Podcasts and to subscribe to the podcast on whatever you use to listen to it. Both of those things really help to boost our visibility to other people who are looking for good theological content in their podcasts. And finally, if you have the means to pitch in a little bit of money to help us cover the monthly cost of hosting the audio files, you can find a donate button at meredithkline.com slash podcast on the right hand side of the page. And any amount that you can give is very much appreciated. Uh, really does encourage Todd and me. And if you don't like the PayPal option behind the donate button, just reach out to us at MeredithKlein.com. I'm sorry. Reach out to us at GloryCloudPodcast at gmail.com, and uh, we can work something else out. Uh, but having said all of that, Todd, how would you like to get off the ground with our discussion this week? Well, again, in the spirit of Meredith Klein, who always taught us to take every verse in context of the big picture of the entire Bible. We're going to do that with some... These aren't quite as obvious as last week's. Last week's were sort of the more famous ones. These ones are maybe not as famous, though a few may be, and may surprise a few people. But we're going to start, number one, with Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 11. Ecclesiastes 3 is that famous passage, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose unto heaven, or under heaven. And there's a reason, there are, there are a couple of reasons why people view this passage a certain way. One is because in the 60s, the birds made this a famous song. To everything there is a season, or turn, 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 it was sometimes called. Those of us old enough to remember, and that was actually used as an anti-war, anti-Vietnam War song. And so it was understood in a certain way because of that song. Then, later, Hallmark got a hold of it. And they saw some of these verses as the perfect thing to put on their Hallmark cards. Uh, that there's a time for every purpose unto heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. Now, they always left out verse 3 in the Hallmark card, a time to kill. Mm. Because that doesn't look very good in a Hallmark card. (laughs) And so because of that, this poem started to be looked upon as sort of a a lovely um, look at life, the way life starts and stops and things happen. And then the third reason is, is because of a translation issue which is in verse 11. Most of the translations have, he has made everything beautiful in its time. And that's the word yapeh in Hebrew. 
but the um, New American Standard has the better translation, which is appropriate in its time. Because hmm. that really changes the understanding. Because if you think of it as beautiful, God made everything beautiful, then killing is beautiful. Dying is beautiful. Losing is beautiful. And notice there's even a time to hate. Hmm. Is hate beautiful? No. And so this Hebrew word can be translated beautiful, but it also can be translated appropriate or fitting. And if you look over a few chapters to chapter 5, verse 18, that's where we see that word again. And the word is fitting. Here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor. So it's not beautiful, but fitting. Now, with that understanding, it changes what this is about. Because this is a frustrating poem. And we've recommended this before, but there are some works by Klein's son. And um, Meredith's son has written on Ecclesiastes. Of course, he's writing a commentary where he expresses this. And so this is a poem of frustration of how God's sovereignty works. That we're completely powerless to change things. And so the time to be born, the time to die is simply in this wacky world of God's providence that we don't control. Things happen. Things happen like that. And it leads, verse 9, to a question, a frustrating question. What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? Mm. In other words, if God is sovereign, if things in this world don't work, cause and effect the way we think it should, now that we live in a fallen world, what's the point of trying to control things by our work? If there's a time that all our work can be taken away, uh, there's a time for war. And so there's a frustration. He's made everything appropriate. But verse 11, nobody understands what God is doing. Hmm. And so instead of Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 11 being this beautiful meditation on life, it's a frustrating meditation on our lack of control. A few of the commentaries who that really understand Ecclesiastes get it, but others do not. Now, uh, has Meredith M. Klein written specifically on this already? I, I think in his monograph on the book, he, he does mention it, if I remember. And I'm sure once his commentary comes out, he's going to deal with this very well. Okay. Well, I will link to whatever I can, I can find online. Okay. So that's number one. Number and that's is that sounds like that's new to you, right, Chris? Yeah, I mean I'm familiar with the passage and uh and with the song, but uh the the translation of that word is new to me, so I appreciate you bringing that out. I didn't think you were that old that you'd remember that song. <laughs> it shows up in different places. <laughs> that's true. It does come back. Okay, the second one. This one you're probably more familiar with the misuse. Joshua 1 9. And this is Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage, do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I should say verse 8 first. The book of the law, th this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And then the Lord promises to be with him wherever he goes. And so the way this is often used is if you have a worship time in the morning and in the evening, and all day you're thinking about the law of God, you're meditating on it, and you're trying to obey everything that you're meditating on, then God will ensure that you have a prosperous life, even spiritually prosperous, you will have good success. So it's given as a law for all people. This is the way, of course, if you're Pentecostal, you may say this is a way of prospering in every area of life. If you're not, this is the way of spiritually prospering in life. But either way, it's a condition. 
that you have to be reading the Bible every day and thinking about how to obey all, all that you read. And that's the means by which you will have prosperity, spiritually or otherwise. Have you heard that before? Uh, yes, um, not as much about the prosperity part. Um, I was waiting to point out that I'm old enough to remember that the very early Michael W. Smith wrote a song about this verse. So, um, and I mean, he basically just repeats the verse without, you know, a lot of commentary on it. But um, I, I think the point we're going to make is that uh, we, we have to understand what God was doing with Joshua in, in order to understand what these words even mean. Exactly. Joshua was a representative leader. Joshua, like Moses, were covenant heads of their community. And so their leadership was unique in the eyes of the Lord. Joshua represented his people. And so the way of success was for the king, even though Joshua was not officially a king, he acted as a leader, a king. And of course, later in Deuteronomy 17, or excuse me, earlier in Deuteronomy 17, we're told that the way the nation will be prosperous is if when they put a king on the throne of the monarchy, he will read the word, he will read and obey the law. And so the king, again, would represent the people. Their success will be found in his obedience. And so to take this and say Joshua represents every Christian and his meditating on the law means our quiet times is to really um, just take it completely out of context. And, and we have to remind our readers that there was really no such thing as quiet times until fairly recently in church history. <laughs> right. For 1,500 years, people didn't have Bibles. The church would have a Bible, the schools would have a Bible, but people didn't have private copies of their Bibles. Maybe if you were very rich, you could, but the average Christian did not. And so the idea that you have to read and meditate morning and evening would be foreign to most of church history. Right. But it's simply not the point that this is a recipe for every Christian. This shows the representative nature of the Old Testament leaders of, of the covenant community. And of course, pointing to Christ who would fulfill the law for us right. by obeying it perfectly. I mean, there's a connection even uh, in their names, right? Exactly. Go so, ahead and say that. I mean, Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua, which is also Joshua. So, I, I mean, here Joshua is very blatantly pointing forward to Christ. It's, uh, it's not an accident that Joshua is the one that gets to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. M Moses didn't end up getting to do that because of his disobedience. But Joshua leads them in um, just as Christ will ultimately usher us into the new heavens and the new earth. Um, and so this is completely about Christ. Uh, it's not that, uh, I mean, granted, in a very general sense, it's not that being strong and courageous are bad things to do. And that's not what I'm saying. But but this particular passage is talking about Christ ultimately leading us into the, the new creation. Yes. And so don't put your people under a covenant of works that if every day you give them a heavy burden they have to do, while they're trying to do their jobs, they have to th be consciously thinking about the law of God all day. And that's the only way that they're going to have spiritual success in life. What, what is the point of Christ dying for us and bearing our burdens and helping us in our weakness? if we have to do this every single day to have success spiritually. Exactly. All right. The third one is probably well known to at least our listeners, and that's Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. This is normally used for what? Well, um, at least in my high school years, it was used in evangelism. Right. It's Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart. And if you hear his voice and open the door of your heart, he will fellowship with you. 
Now, there is a principle, and, and Greg Beale wrote a book about this called The Right Doctrine from the Wrong Text. Have you read that? Yeah. It's a great book. Huh? Yes. And he makes the point that sometimes we can preach truth even though that particular verse we're interpreting wrong. If, we, if our theology is right, we can still preach truth from a verse even if we're misinterpreting um, it because it's simply true elsewhere in the Bible. And that's a good point for those of you who listen to sermons and you can be critical that you, you may know that a preacher interpreted a verse wrongly, you've studied on it. If his theology behind it is correct, it's still preaching we should heed because what he's explaining is probably true in other passages, so it's true. It is God's word. It just not, it's not maybe in that particular verse, but if it's in the Word of God, it's still something you should heed and take to yourself. You don't have the privilege to say, well, I don't have to listen. He got that verse wrong. So, in a general sense, you can say, yeah, Jesus is calling people uh, to fellowship with him. There's truth there. But that particular verse, um, Jesus is speaking to the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church. And so this is a very threatening, negative statement. I mean, even the image, think of the imagery of you, you're meeting at church. Supposedly you're preaching about Jesus, you're praying to him, you're talking about his presence, and he's outside the church knocking to get in. Hmm. So that's a frightening image. Right. Your church is so dead that Jesus, his spirit, is not even there. And he's warning you, he's about to walk away for good. So instead of a wonderfully inviting evangelistic verse, this is actually a, a very frightening verse to the visible church that is losing its light completely. Hmm. Excellent point. So that kind of changes the way we think about it, don't you think? Oh, yeah. That's a 180 degrees difference there. All right, that brings us to number four. And it's Second Corinthians 10.5. I mentioned this in another podcast on uh, theonomy. Second Corinthians 10.5. Uh, I'll read 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity, to the obedience of Christ. Now, this is the most popular verse used by either theonomists or um, world viewers, if we can call them that, that says that we need to bring everything in culture under what the Word of God teaches about it. We need to think biblically about movies we watch. We need to evaluate the movies. We need to evaluate politics, culture, and we need to see the Christian answer, um, the Christian way of thinking about all these things. So it's, it's used as this is how we um, take dominion in our thinking. But that's completely out of context. Paul is not talking about culture. There's nothing in Second Corinthians that Paul is, Paul is not interested in culture. Right. What Paul is fighting is a false view of how to draw people to the church and to the faith. The um, false teachers were using fleshly, worldly means to, to do that kind of battle, to bring people in, to defeat them in a sense, to bring them into obedience of Christ. They were using flowery words. They were using their own charismatic personalities. And Paul says, we don't use those worldly weapons to cast down strongholds. These are spiritual strongholds of people, unbelievers, bound by Satan. We don't need those. We cast those down. We bring every thought in captivity into the obedience of Christ by using spiritual weapons. The every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ is unbelievers. They are the ones that are converted to Christ to obey him. But we don't use fleshly means, is the idea. That's the whole that's the point of the, really the whole book of Second Corinthians. So to think in the middle of Second Corinthians where he's talking about these matters 
Oh, let me take one verse and talk about how to take dominion over culture. Then I'll pick up a little bit and completely go to another topic. <laughs> that's not that's not the point. So that's a really misuse, a famous misuse in our day of Second Corinthians ten five. I know you've heard this one. Oh yes. A lot. And you're right, um, by people who really do want to take over the culture. And I, I was even noticing the verse that comes right after that as you were reading it. Uh, verse 6 says, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. And it seems like the culture, culture warriors are uh, poised and ready to punish every disobedience. Right, when he's talking about in the church. Yeah. <laughs> and then verse 7 picks up again the idea, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? Again, they were looking at these false teachers and they were so much more attractive and charismatic mm. and, than Paul that they thought Paul was a very poor person to use to bring people to the faith. So they were relying on worldly carnal means that Paul would not use. Well, the next one, and this may be one that's probably the most surprising and, and well-known, our well-known one that is used in a certain way, and that's Philippians 2, 6. I'm sorry, Philippians 1, 6. I looked ahead. Philippians 1, 6. And the verse says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, this is an example of the right doctrine from the wrong text. Mm. Because normally, what is this verse used for? What doctrine? Sanctification. Sanctification or perseverance of the saints. That what God began, he will preserve you to the end and he will work in you to bring you to Christ. The context of Philippians is not individual sanctification, but the church's use for the gospel's sake. Because from in verses 3 through 5, Paul thanks God for them, that they're partners with him in the gospel. That's the context. And in verse 6, the you in the Greek is in the plural. It's not in you as a Christian individually but you as a church. And so notice verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, I give thanks. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, you all, will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. That means that, means that the Lord will continue to use his church to bring about the fulfillment of his redemptive plan all the way to the return of Christ. What God has begun in you, he will complete. Not that he will bring you personally one day to heaven. Now, of course, all that is true. And so if you preach it that way, everything you're saying is true. But the context of Philippians 1 is about the church as a whole, their ministry and being involved in the gospel, that God will continue to use the church, not only this church, but throughout the age, for the gospel's purpose until the day of Christ Jesus. So this is almost like a, a postscript to uh, the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, so what God started in the church, he will complete, not with you sanctifying you is not is not the point though that point is so prominent elsewhere that it's okay if you miss the context of the at least you're preaching truth but really that's not the point when you read the context of Philippians 1 hmm. and I think seeing that you is plural helps yes definitely okay the next one is Psalm 51 11 Mm. This, is, this is fun, by the way. Don't you think this is fun? <laughs> I enjoy this a lot, and I, it seems like our listeners do too, so I'm, I'm glad. Good, I hope they do. Um, this one, some are familiar with, and you all know the the verse as well as the song. Do not cast away, do not cast me away from your presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And of course, we all sing that, and when we sing that, it should raise a question. 
Why are we asking God not to take his Holy Spirit from us when that's impossible? That we don't believe we can lose our salvation. So why are we asking God that that doesn't happen when he's always he's already promised it? Well, the problem is we, we tend to think when we look at the Old Testament in ordo salutis categories. And you know what I mean by that. Right. The way salvation Just works out in our individual lives. Right. And so we tend to look at the Old Testament in the same way as the New, thinking that when David said this, he meant it the same way as we would understand it in the New Covenant. But remember, David did not have a full understanding of the filling of the Spirit for every believer and sanctification. The way we think of doc, um, systematic theology, David didn't have that. Mm-hmm. What David understood of the Spirit is the Spirit gave him the power and the wisdom and the calling to be king. Hmm. When he was king, the Spirit came upon him for that task. So David is not begging God not to take his salvation away, his eternal salvation. And so we shouldn't have to beg God not to take our salvation away. David is praying that he could still be king. Hmm. That God, God would not take his calling, his kingship away from him, which was a very real possibility for what he had done with Bathsheba. Right. So it's always made me comfortable when modern Christians are asking God not to take the spirit away from them. Have you ever thought that's a little odd to be asking? Yeah, that always makes me a little uncomfortable when those words get sung. So I, I'm glad you chose to talk about this one all right that was a quick one so we'll go to the (laughs) next one philippians 4 8 back to philippians back to philippians philippians 4 8 i think when i even say that a lot of you know what it's going to be finally brethren whatever things are true whatever things are noble whatever things are just whatever things are pure whatever things are lovely whatever things are of good report if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Now, in our modern society, how is in church, how is this verse often used in reference to to what? Uh, what popular culture, movies and music? Exactly. Entertainment and thought life. Mm-hmm. And so the idea is we're only allowed to watch things or read things that fit all these categories. They have to be pure, noble, etc. So if anyone doesn't want doesn't like what you're watching, they'll go to Philippians four eight and they'll say, We're not allowed to watch that movie because it has this and it doesn't pass the test. Mm. You can only think of these things. And you shouldn't be reading that novel because that novel has this or that and it's not pure and lovely and noble. Well, you probably won't be surprised to know that Paul was not thinking of entertainment in Philippians 4. (laughs) Right. The context of Philippians 4 is about people, people who are not getting along in the church. It starts off in verse 2, where he employs the two women to get along. And then he, verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all. He talks about the peace they need. And so the context of this first half of Philippians is getting along in Christ, forbearing with one another. And so verse 8 ends that section with how to think about people, and it's specifically Christians. You can look upon their weaknesses. You can only look upon where they fall short. You can look upon only their sins. But what is the proper way to look on genuine believers? Whatever things are true, whatever are noble in them. So if you put in them after each of these, that's the context. Whatever things are just in them, whatever things are pure in them, whatever things are lovely in them. See, all Christians have these to some extent. If you're a genuine Christian, you have, you're noble, you're just, you're lovely. You have some character of Christ or to think on these things and not all focus on the shortcomings. Mm. If you think on these things, 
That's how you can get along and love sinners in your church. So don't rob the beauty of this passage by becoming a legalist on whatever what movies everybody can watch or what books they can read. That's not the point at all. Paul didn't stop in the middle of talking about getting along to say, oh, you know, in case you're reading a novel or whatever. <laughs> right. The latest thing on the Philippian bookshelves. <laughs> uh, the Philippian Netflix. Right? <laughs> uh, that's a great point. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't other verses that might apply to a certain situation like that, but it's certainly not Philippians 4.8. It's not mm. the point at all. All right. We're already at number eight. This is going quick, quickly. John 14, 25 and 26. John 14, 25 and 26. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now in more charismatic circles and even broad evangelical circles, how is this first used? Uh, this is where my experience get, gets a little limited, but I think what you're driving at is that the Holy Spirit's going to teach us. Yeah, and it's, the idea is that um, you don't really need teachers, you don't need theologians, you don't need pastors. If you open the Bible and you pray, the Holy Spirit will teach you what you need to know. Well, and ex in extreme uh, cases, someone might even say you wouldn't even need the Bible, that that would be a dead letter, that just the Holy Spirit on his own can teach us. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah, you could go that far, and, and I'm sure in certain circles they do. But what they forget or ignore the context is Jesus is speaking to the apostles. Mm -hmm. And it's to the apostles who are going to need to write down everything Jesus said and did for their accounts. And so how are they going to remember in three years what to write? How are they going to remember accurately the words of Christ? Well, here um, Jesus is promising them that the Spirit will bring them to remembrance everything he told them. And so we that's our confidence in the Word of God, that we're not relying on faulty memory I mean, I can't remember conversations from three years ago. <laughs> right. So how are they going to remember even longer than that when they're finally writing their books accurately what Jesus said? Well, they're given a special promise that the Spirit will bring this to remember it. remembrance. Now, John Gill writes, This accounts for it how the evangelist, some years after the death of Christ, at different times and places, and without consulting each other, could commit to writing the life, actions, sayings, and sermons of Christ, with all the minute circumstances attending them. So the older the older commentaries get it. Right. And sometimes you have to go back to see how people used to understand it instead of only looking at what moderns tend to do with it. So this is a very specific promise and it's for the apostles it's not for everyone who flips open their bible and it happens to open to that that verse right and it applies to us because the spirit illuminates the word to us but it's the word that god promised to give the apostles to commit to writing okay it doesn't jump the word into some mysterious um direct revelation of you know, every understanding of the word just comes to you mm -hmm. if you simply pray. So, yeah, the context of who Christ is speaking to and why and why they needed that makes all the difference, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. All right, number nine, drum roll. And that is Proverbs 23, 7. This is one of my favorite ones that gets misused Proverbs 23 7 for as he thinks in his heart so he is as a man thinks in his heart so he is I'm even leaving out the second part because that's usually what's quoted now 
What? How is that normally used? Well, it's sort of the um, the Joel Osteen type thinking. If you have a positive mental attitude, as a man thinks in his heart, so you will be. If you think yourself loved, if you think yourself prosperous, if you think yourself blessed, you will be. Hmm. As a man thinks, so he is. You have to have a good self-image of yourself to be able to survive in the world. It's always about positive thoughts, positive confessions, and that's how you'll be a positive person. What you focus on on the inside, what you think about, you will become on the outside. Have you have you heard that before from this verse? Yeah, it's been many years, but it yeah, I have heard that. Um, and you're right; it tends to be. Um, I I think when I was hearing it, it was more in Christian psychology circles because that was all the rage in the in the '90s. Um, but it really fits the Joel Osteen types as well. The and all you have to do is look at the context around this verse to see what's happening. It's not just any man, it's a certain man that the the author of Proverbs is talking about. He's speaking of a specific man that we see in verses 6 through 8. It says, Do not eat the bread of a selfish man, or desire his delicacies. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. He says to you, eat and drink, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the morsel you have eaten and waste your compliments. So the man speaking of is the selfish man who may be trying to flatter you, but inside he can't stand you. Hmm. So it's warning, don't don't be deceived by flattery or by money. Because he may say to you, here, let me give you things. But his heart is not with you. But as a man thinks, that's what's really going on. And so it's a way to warn people that what you're hearing is often with these type of fakes, not really what's going on. They may be speaking very positively towards you, but that's not what they're thinking. What they're thinking is what really is. But you're only focusing on what they're doing for you, how they're flattering you and giving you things. So it's a warning about how selfish people try to trick you. So it has nothing to do with how you think about yourself at all. Huh. It's, it's simply saying with a narcissist, with an egocentric person, and they're trying to flatter you and tempt you, don't buy it. Don't fawn over it. Because what you're hearing is not what really is what he's thinking. What he's thinking is how he really is, and it's different. That makes a lot of sense. That completely changes that verse, doesn't it? Doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's not about me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a warning to you, but it's not about your thoughts. It's about being aware how people speak differently than what they're actually believing. Yeah. And we see that warning in Proverbs 26, three chapters later. He who hates disguises, he who hates disguises it with his lips, but he lays up deceit in his heart. When he speaks graciously, do not believe him. For there are seven abominations in his heart. The same idea. There are people who hate you, who will disguise it and speak graciously to you. But that's not what's going on in his heart. Be careful. Seems to be a common theme that runs through the book of Proverbs, is that you, know, you can discern a person's true colors, but not by outward appearances, not by uh, mere words. Um that that discernment takes a little more effort and careful attention. Yes. All right. Well, that's our part two. We don't have a part three, but maybe if I find 10 more or if our listeners can find 10 more, we can do that. But it is a nice break, but it is a reminder on a serious level. Interpret your Bible carefully. Carefully always look for context. Try to go back in history and read how different people viewed it. And remember the big picture of the entire Bible as it's fulfilled by Christ. We'll stop there. 
Very good. Well, uh, that would be great if our uh, listeners had more suggestions, some concrete uh, verses or passages that they wanted us to to talk about like this. So uh, you can always email those to us at glorycloudpodcast at gmail.com. You can tweet at us. I am at Machen Guy. Todd is at T Bordeaux. The podcast itself is at Glory Cloud Pod. Um, I am also on Instagram as at Machen Guy. Um, but the, the most important thing is that you can uh, join us at the Meredith Klein Facebook group. Just let the admins know that you listen to the podcast and they can get you added. And we will be back again to talk more about Klein and the church.